In professional Rainbow Six teams, coaching is often shrouded in mystery. From the outside, it's basically impossible to tell what a coach is actually doing. And of course, that also applies to me. I can't tell you about the philosophy behind Shaz or Lycan's coaching, but I can tell you about the philosophy behind my own coaching. After all, I've been a proly coach. And in this video, I'll try to explain some of the core ideas of my approach to coaching. So what kind of a coach am I? First of all, and I think that's pretty obvious, I don't radiate authority. I'm not a natural born leader. But nevertheless, I've pretty much always been in leadership positions, be it in school, video games or sports. And I like to think that I got into those positions mainly as a result of my skill. I earned respect through proving my competence, not necessarily through charisma. And it's going to be the same thing in Rainbow. The value of me as a coach lies in my understanding of the game. So consequently, most of my work will be focused on actual improvements inside the server. If the team struggles with a lack of motivation, or if there are a lot of interpersonal problems, I'm probably not the right guy for you. Don't get me wrong, there are inevitably going to be problems, and I will be able to mediate. It's just that I don't want it to be the focus of my work. And especially that point about motivation is very important. Because what I'm trying to do will not work if the players don't buy into it. One of the core pillars of my coaching philosophy is simply hard work. I want to be known as a team that works the hardest in the entire league. Quite frankly, you're not supposed to have a life as an esports pro. We will have just the right amount of free time to prevent burnout and injury. But other than that, I expect everyone on the team to dedicate their life to Rainbow. If you want to have a fun and relaxed time, that's totally fine. Go get a normal office job. But my team is not the right place for that. The thing is, if you give your best and you do everything you can, but you still lose. I can actually deal with that. It's still frustrating, but I can accept it. What I cannot accept is losing as a result of not giving it your all. That's actually the reason why I quit coaching Mocket after losing at the Invitational. If we had put in more effort leading up to the tournament, we could have actually won against Liquid. So that loss was just unbearable to me. That was one of the few times in my life where I was actually really angry about losing. And of course I'm not just blaming the team here. In part, this also happened because of my shortcomings as a coach. I just wasn't able to sell my vision. But because of that experience, I vowed to never make that mistake again. So every team I work with in the future is going to work hard and a lot. Now, I'm not some kind of hardline dictator. I'm very much open for compromise, but there are some things that are just not negotiable. Working hard is one of them, and the other one is the playstyle of the team. Last week, I made a separate video about what I think is the optimal way of playing the game. Link is in the top right corner. The short form summary is that I want structure. I want to make sure that my team is playing with a specific plan in mind. I just really hate it when teams are stalling out in super common situations that they've seen countless times already. So with me, that is not going to happen. That being said, I am ready to make some compromises here. Depending on what kind of players I'm working with, I can accept a little less structure than I'd maybe want. But in the grand scheme of things, the team is going to be structured at least on the level of SSG or Dark Zero, and that is not up for debate. That's also the main reason why I've been declining all the offers I got in the past year. There's just no point in me coaching a team like Rogue, for example. Players like Aces, Corey, and presumably Leon just have a fundamentally different view on the game, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's just not reconcilable with my philosophy. That's actually the main lesson I learned when working with Rogue. On that team, I was kind of just being swept along by a system that I didn't particularly liked. And that was a miserable experience. The problem was that I just didn't have the confidence to try and change the system. I mean, back then I was just some random pleb and I was in a team with very successful players like Slash and Easily. But since then, I've gotten a lot more confident. And now I'm actually capable of insisting on my opinions. On that note, something else I've learned is that even if you aren't that confident, you at least have to pretend that you are, because otherwise no one is going to buy into your vision. Okay, so that's it for the general slash soft skills part of my coaching. Now I want to get a bit more specific as to how the day-to-day -day is going to look like. 
Obviously, most of the coaching happens in and around scrims. And for scrims, there is really only one rule. You have to treat them seriously. There should be no difference between how you play in scrims versus how you play on game day. Of course, that doesn't mean that we are never going to try out new strats. I just want to make sure that every single round we play can be a learning experience. If we lose a round because one of the players was doing some monkey shit, then there is nothing we can learn from that and it was just a waste of time. The only way to make sure that our strats work on game day is to go hard in scrims. When we are reviewing scrims, I never want to hear that wouldn't have happened in a real game. That sentence just gives me an aneurysm. Speaking of scrim review though, that is actually going to be the centerpiece of my coaching, because that is where the improving happens. If you just scrim a few maps and then talk about them for a few minutes afterwards, the chances of improving are pretty small. There's no way you remember all the mistakes you made, and even worse, there's no way you're going to remember the changes that you wanted to make as a result. So the solution is to have a proper scrim review. How's that going to look like? Basically, I pick and choose a few situations that I was unhappy with, I put them into a PowerPoint, and then we'll have a discussion. We will explore what kind of thinking led us into that situation, and we'll try to come up with ways on what we can do better. And here, I think it's very important that it's a group discussion and not a lecture. In traditional sports, a coach would probably just explain what he disliked, and then he would tell the team what to do differently. But the thing is, rainbow coaching is not really comparable to traditional coaching. In a regular football team, for example, the guy with the most experience is probably the coach. And that's why it makes sense that he calls the shots. But when I join a rainbow team, there's a good chance that one of the players is going to have more pro league experience than I do. So it would be pretty ridiculous to leave the entire problem solving up to me. There are going to be situations in which I just don't know the correct solution. I mean, after all, the game is pretty difficult. And that means that the process of improving needs to be more democratic. Ideally, I would like to have every player involved in that discussion. Although I already know that this is not how it's going to go. But that's okay. In every team, there are always going to be players that are more vocal than others. The most important thing is that at the end of the review, we have a list of specific changes that we are going to implement. It's not enough to just vaguely talk about things. In order to effectively improve, we have to agree on specific solutions. Now, of course, there are some situations where there isn't really a specific fix. For example, you often hear players in post-match interviews say stuff like, we need better teamwork. And that might be true, but as a coach, I always try my best to avoid these general statements. Because they are not actionable advice. If I told my team that we needed better communication, for example, what are they supposed to do with that feedback? It's not actionable. So instead, I always try to give specific advice. And that list that we get at the end of our scrim review is exactly that. Specific and actionable changes. This list really is the centerpiece of my coaching. Because assuming that we actually implement the change, we will have fixed one mistake. And that immediately means that we're going to win more rounds, which is kind of why I'm here. So I'm very fond of that list. And coincidentally, it also synergizes really well with my proposed playstyle. Since my team is going to be very structured, they are going to experience the same situations over and over again. So there's a good chance they will be able to immediately implement the change and see the result of it. Alright, so that is the main part of my coaching. After every scrim, there is going to be a review session in which we talk about a few of the mistakes and, more importantly, we come up with specific solutions. And those reviews are obviously going to be focused on macro-level team mistakes. But of course, there are also going to be micro-level individual mistakes. And I'll try to fix those too. Although I would say that I'm rather working on macro-level mistakes. Quite frankly, I can't teach players how to shoot. Partly because I myself can't shoot, and also because there isn't really that much to teach. But what I can do is recognize patterns in decision making, for example. Maybe there's a player that is consistently over aggressive, and that is something I can try to fix. Okay, so that covers everything that happens in and around scrims. The last big area of coaching is probably the actual Pro League games, or rather the preparation for Pro League games. 
Because, as you know, during the game, your impact as a coach is a bit limited. You can basically only talk two times every game. As you might imagine, I'm not going to use these timeouts to try and hype up my players. I will mainly be focusing on in-game stuff, and I actually do take pride in being able to come up with smart adjustments between rounds. But again, the main part is preparing for Pro League games. First of all, there is going to be statistical analysis. I want to know what maps our opponents like to play. I want to know which operators they like to ban, and I want to know which side they are going to pick first. Because not only is that nice to know during the game, so we can pick the optimal operators, but it's also great to know leading up to the game. Because if we know that our opponents like to play Cafe with a Thatcher ban, then that is what we can focus on in scrims. We can play more Cafe than usual, and we can intentionally not play Thatcher in order to prepare for the game. So that's statistical analysis. But the arguably bigger part of analysis is qualitative. It's about watching the opponent's games and trying to find patterns that can be abused. Of course, the depth of the actual counter strain that we do is going to depend on the kind of team we're facing. Some teams are really loose and flexible, so there's not that much you can do. But even for those teams, there are going to be patterns, so it's still worth to put in the effort. If only for the purpose of due diligence. And of course, there is not enough time in a day to do all of that myself. So I will be closely working with a dedicated analyst. Okay. I think that covered the main ideas behind my philosophy as a coach. Before you ask, this video is not some kind of letter of application. At the moment, I'm not actively looking to be a coach again. I do honestly consider the pro league offers that I get, but I don't need to be a coach, so I can afford to be really picky. If someone came along with a really interesting project, I could see myself saying yes. But I don't think there are a lot of teams that would meet the requirements. It would have to be an English or German speaking team, it would have to be a team with a team house, and it would have to be a team that shares my philosophy on how the game is meant to be played. So that kind of limits the options a bit. Alright, that's it for the video. In a way, this can be seen as a sequel to last week's video. I know that this type of video is not that interesting for my general audience, but I just felt like putting my ideas on paper. And you know, if you are on a T3 or T4 team, you might be able to use some of the stuff I talked about here. If not, I still hope you enjoyed the video and thanks for watching.